On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass Amherst student Maura Murray disappeared in the White Mountains of New Hampshire in one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. For years, we have covered Maura's case and the tireless online community that surrounds it in great detail. We have since expanded our mission with this series, raising awareness and shining a light on the stories of other missing persons. We now sit on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Private Investigations for the Missing, which was founded by Bruce Maitland. Bruce's daughter, Brianna Maitland, went missing from Montgomery, Vermont on March 19th of 2004, just six weeks after and about 80 miles away from where Maura Murray vanished. Private Investigations for the Missing aims to assist with investigations for underserved families whose missing loved ones have been forgotten by the media or by law enforcement. Through our growing community, we hope to shed a light on these cold cases. Families and loved ones can reach out to us at investigationsforthemissing.org. This is Missing. Welcome back to Missing. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing excellent today. Uh, so good I don't deserve it. How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm doing fine. I'm fine as well. Um, and uh, and Lance, in this episode, we are talking about the collision report in Maura Murray's missing persons case. Obviously, Maura Murray went missing from North Haverhill, New Hampshire, February 9th, 2004, on Route 112 heading east. And there's always been a lot of sort of mystery around how the car got there, where the damage came from, um, just really the timeline in general. This whole area of Moore Murray's disappearance has always been very, very suspicious and just mysterious. Yeah, a lot of questions that don't have answers, obviously, because we don't know where the person is who was driving the car, who would have those answers. But this very comprehensive report that was put together by Mr. Daniel J. Parka from Parka Collision Consultants, he was a local guy, a local company, did this on behalf of the Murray family uh, gratis. So he was not paid for this, but his work is extremely thorough. And you know it's coming from a good source because this is somebody who investigates collisions for insurance purposes. This is not something that this gentleman's company does on the side um, for, you know, a hobby. This is what he does as uh, as as a business. So he takes his work seriously and it's very evident here. And we try to get through it. And this is the third episode. Yeah. Right. So hopefully we'll get through the rest of this report on this third episode. Um, and uh, really it it does sort of skim the surface and we try to get as detailed as possible, but it is a very dense report. So um, you're, you're along with us as we're trying to kind of talk through what the findings are. Absolutely. And uh, it is a 21 page report. And, uh, and I think we've gotten through 18 pages, Lance. So we want to finish reading the report here and then read some of the comments from part two on YouTube and invite you to comment on the YouTube video for this one, which is part three. Maybe we'll do a follow up. Um, I think maybe we should talk to a, an old friend, uh, but we'll bring that up a little bit later. Um, okay, Lance, so page 19 starts with the Swiftwater Way Station, and this is approximately nine-tenths of a mile to the west of the collision where Maura Murray's car was left. And uh, we've always said about a mile, so that, that was pretty much right on the dot. Right, and, and that would indicate that Mora passed by the Swiftwater Way Station before she reached the accident location. So about a mile but nine-tenths of a mile down the road past the Swiftwater Way Station was where Moore's car was discovered facing west. So she was heading in an easterly direction. Her car ended up facing west towards, you know, the way to think about it is towards the uh, Swiftwater Way Station, which is right. a little convenience store slash gas station. 
And as Parker notes, the fuel gauge showed that the tank was full. And if Mora was traveling southeast on Route 112 the way we think she was traveling, prior to the curve in the roadway, she would have passed the Swiftwater Way Station, as you mentioned, Lance. And if Mora pulled into this location to fuel, she would need to go into the building to pay because the pumps were an older style that did not accept any type of credit or debit payment. And I don't believe there's any public account of an employee of the Swiftwater Way Station ever reporting having seen anyone who matched Mora's description coming in to, to purchase gas. And he goes on to detail uh, that they attempted to speak with a female cashier who was reluctant to offer her name and indicated she was working at the time but did not remember Mora entering the store. So she did, however, indicate that another woman was outside the store and at the front corner. It appeared to her that the unknown woman was hesitant about going into the building only because of a red pickup truck with a wooden bed that was traveling very slowly past the parking lot. And he's questioning, could this unknown woman at the corner have been Maura Murray? So this woman, the sighting, isn't somebody who went in to pay for gas. This is somebody who is on the corner who seemed hesitant because of this truck. And the truck had made several passes before leaving the area. Shortly thereafter, rescue and police vehicles passed the gas station while en route to where Morris Saturn was located. That is a very interesting statement. Yeah, especially when when you take into account this whole report is a collision report. This really isn't isn't part of the collision. I mean, he's sort of following up on the fuel gauge, but this isn't exactly part of the collision. So I, I do find it interesting as well. And it's not exactly the old story, I thought. Um, and so he goes on a little bit. He says, during our examination of the scene, a red pickup truck, parentheses, Chevy Ford type model. So I guess he wasn't sure which kind he says with a wooden bed passed our location and took a right onto Bradley Hill road adjacent to the home of Butch Atwood. The vehicle displayed New Hampshire registration and he, he lists a number. He says there were two Caucasian males in the vehicle. Again, interesting. It all of a sudden turns into like an eye, a sighting and I eyewitness report. Okay, so I uh, just want to clarify what was just read. According to the female cashier who was working at the Swiftwater Way Station, she saw a female outside on the corner. She saw this red truck pass by slowly a few times prior to the police arriving at the scene of Moore's accident. And then during the examination of this of the accident site, Later on, years later, yeah, a red pickup truck with a wooden bed that matches the description took a right onto Bradley Hill Road. So if you're at the accident site looking up towards Butch Atwood's house, it takes a right onto Bradley Hill Road. Right. Now, I just want to note that I think the original uh, red truck is suspicious report included that the license plates were Massachusetts uh, registration. So I just want to be cautious here and say that just because that pickup truck is written about in that paragraph doesn't mean it's the same pickup truck from years earlier, really years earlier, about five years earlier, you know. How interesting that they were examining the scene years later and the truck matching the description aside from the license plate passes by and stands out so quickly that he's able to document the registration, the, the license plate. He's got the license plate number you know, maybe there's a couple people there and, and he said it out loud and, and they, they remembered it, mm -hmm. but he, he made that decision that quickly. Yeah. Now that, that I do think we've been there before and like the first car, the first vehicle that drives by is a red pickup truck. And we've like laughed like, Oh, of course, of course it is, you know? And then, and I think that's just a common vehicle, obviously in general, but especially up there, a lot of people kind of in, in the business where they need um, pickup trucks. Now the wood slat thing is, is a bit unique. I, I would say the wooden bed, um, is a bit more unique than, I, I don't think we've ever seen a truck that fits exactly that description up there. But of course we didn't start going up there until like, uh, nine years after Mora went missing. Right. And to, to be clear, part of me finds that suspicious, but another part of me also says this is, somebody who might have seen more of that night and might be a witness that hopefully was spoken with and, and um, maybe had another account, uh, maybe a, like the direction in which Mora could have walked if she walked away. Maybe this red pickup truck saw her. I'm not saying that this 
red pickup truck had anything to do with their um, disappearance in this particular conversation. But is this the same red pickup truck that was going back and forth years ago? I'm going to assume no, um, because it's years ago and people change their vehicles. I don't think there's any reason to assume it is, um, because the registration's right there. If this was like more Murray's abductor, I feel like that just would have been followed up on by now. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume they're separate. I don't know. Um, but I, I think for the purposes of this, we should, we should take them separate, um, because separately they're both kind of suspicious, but I, I think the, that first one is much more suspicious, right? Like if you want to go over that a little bit more, I would, I mean, I'm absolutely up for that. So the witness appeared to her that the unknown woman at the corner was hesitant about going into the building. And the report here says only because of a red pickup truck with wooden bed was traveling very slowly past the parking lot. So I'm not really sure how that came to be known, right? Why is that the reason that the unknown woman was hesitant about going into the building? I, I guess we don't, we can't really say for a fact it's because of the wood, wooden, the, the red pickup truck. Maybe that's what the cashier said, but if she didn't talk to her, how does she know that she was afraid of that truck? Like, how do we know she didn't get into that truck? But otherwise, I and I'm, I'm I completely agree that this entire thing sounds very suspicious because yeah, I, um, this truck was there moving back and forth, very, traveling very slowly in the parking lot right before a person, right before the police come by, and this woman Maura Murray right down the road disappears, uh, no, not even a mile away. So yeah, I think I think this account um, from the cashier, this eyewitness account from the cashier, it could be very very important. And we do know over the years of looking into this uh, disappearance that there was another witness to a red truck around that same area and time frame. So is this woman, Maura Murray, that, that is spotted here? Or is the woman who the cashier spots, is this this witness that we're speaking of right now? Okay, I'm gonna ha- I, I'm gonna go ahead and say that I don't think it's that woman because the cashier was a friend with that woman who had walked down to the store and was the the witness to the red truck previously. So I think she just would have known if it was her friend. You know what I mean? And and I think she was in the store too at, at that point. Um, That's if a good I point. Remember correctly. That is a great point. Yeah. Yeah, but I do think we should go back and and check this out a little bit. Um, I want to play a clip from Clint Harding from an old episode of Missing Maura Murray. I think this was episode 12 called Rusty Knife, Red Truck, and A-Frame House. And so Clint was really one of the first sources um, that we heard from regarding the red truck. So let's, let's play a quick clip from episode 12 of Missing Maura Murray now. Do you have any information on uh, this red truck that is, uh, it just kind of gets uh, revisited every every few months or so, um, this red truck that was in the area. Um, you know anything about that? Yeah. Yes, I do. I've, I've heard uh, the witness uh, that, that spotted this red truck. I've got some of her stuff that she said uh, in front of me here. And that's uh, She was a local resident very close to where the accident took place with Mara. Uh, thing of it is, I'll, I'll just say this in advance, is this is not something that I've all, I've really ever associated with Mara, but then I, you know, as I look at it closer, maybe we should look at this a little bit harder because the timeline is, is probably a little closer to when Mara had her accident than I thought it was. So anyway, let's talk about the red truck. So this uh, this this person is walking from her residence to the Swiftwater store, and I'm sure you guys have heard of that store yep. by now. Yep. Uh, she thinks it's around seven o'clock that she's walking to the store that same Monday night that Mara went missing. Uh, as she was walking up a hill, uh, a truck passed her and and slowed down. And when it got uh, to the middle of the hill, it stopped in the road. And she immediately noticed the license plates of this truck, and it was Massachusetts, uh, according to her. Of course, it is dark out, and there was only one street light, and she points that out. But 
so anyway, so she sees this truck. It's kind of almost like it's looking. F- it's it's spotted her and it's trying to see if it knows her. That's kind of how she uh, described it. She was, she does say she wasn't afraid. She didn't feel like she was in any danger. She just felt like it was maybe somebody trying to see if they knew her. So as she got closer to the truck, though, the truck ended up taking off. Or you know, not and I don't mean that in a nefarious way. It just means that it ended up leaving before she even got up to it. So, so she uh, kind of it goes out of her mind, and she's uh, walking to the store. When she gets t- towards the parking lot of the Swiftwater store, she sees the truck again, and it's in the parking lot. And this is now a well-lit uh, parking lot, so she can, she can get a little bit better view. She could, thinks there's maybe even more than one person in the truck, is, if I believe, uh, believe right. But as she walks up, uh, let's see. Yeah, basically, so she walks up, and then the truck uh, departs from from the gas station or from the Swiftwater store and heads east towards where the accident took place. So if if her time time frame is right and she was walking to the store at 7, and and it sounds like this car was probably about 10 minutes ahead of Mara when it left the parking lot of the store. So this, and then that was the last she saw of the truck. Uh, she said she was in the store for about 30 to 45 minutes, and it was about tw- uh, th- 20 or 30 minutes after she had been in the store that she heard uh, police go by, and that was probably the cop respondent. That was probably the first responding officer to get to the uh, site. When she walked back from the store to her house, uh, an, a- an ambulance uh, that had responded to Mara's uh, wreck. Uh, actually was driving the other way now. It was leaving the scene of the accident, and it actually stopped when it saw her walking because it thought maybe uh, that could be the person, that, that could be the owner of the car. And so when the uh, ambulance or when the rescue uh, vehicle approached her, uh, they actually knew her. So then they realized that it wasn't the, the person in the, it wasn't Mara. Does the witness, did you mention anything more specific about the truck? Was there any writing on it or anything like that? or? Uh, she s- believes it was a uh, f- uh, four-wheel drive truck, three four-ton pickup, because it sat up high. Mm-hmm. The other thing she remembers about it is the window in the back was hard to see in. It wasn't very large. She descri- I think she described an eagle on the back window. Uh, she thinks it might have been an older truck, but I think the biggest point she made about the truck was that she believes it was used for hauling wood she said she's thinking it had uh, like wood slats on the uh uh in the bed of the truck so I, you know i don't so it's really hard to say i know she did try uh to go online and find that truck she couldn't find the truck again never saw the truck again in the area but she did try to uh, go online and try to find a, a close resemblance to that truck and i don't know if she ever was successful in that when did she give this statement well right now i'm actually quoting her when she got on a message board so uh i don't i think it was like three days maybe after the uh accident she lived in the area was going for a yes. walk going to the store she was getting some items at the store and she actually spent 30 to 45 minutes in the store, and I think she did make a comment to the uh, workers in the store about the truck, asking them if, if that the uh, pers- people in the truck came in the store or not, and they said that no, the people never came in the store. So whoever was in that truck had just pulled into the parking lot and was kind of sitting there for a, a little bit, and then when she got closer to them, I, that's when they left. So orient me a little bit with um, the direction the truck was going. Is that the same direction that Morris' car would have been going, or would that be? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it was going huh. east. And this store, and I don't, you guys, have, I'm sure, have driven past it. It's not far at all from from the accident location. No, it was, no, it isn't. And it's it actually like, really small. I kind of wonder what she was doing in there for 35 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I, she she knows the uh, store owner, so it could have oh, just okay. been talking to you know who knows, but. But yeah, that's what she says. She was in there for 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, so from the accident site, it's probably, what, a quarter of a mile? Yeah, exactly. And and that was always something, you know, for thinking about, well, you know, if Mara was just wanting to, to find safety that night and she didn't trust the school bus driver, that was a very good place she could have could have went to. You know, it was right, she had just passed it before she wrecked, so she could have went to the store and gotten help. You know, if that was what it was about for her. But, you know, and obviously... You know, if she had been drinking, uh, she might want to get away from the scene, too. 
just to clarify, the red truck left the Swiftwater stage shop before Mara's car went by. Right, and I'm I'm estimating about ten minutes before Mara got to the area. So uh, here was a quote uh, about about Miss Ordway or Miss uh, Robinson approaching the the stage shop. Uh, she says, "As I approached the stage shop, the truck was in the stage shop parking lot. I could." Tell there was someone watching me, and as I got in the light of the pumps, the red truck pulled away, again towards the accident. When I went in the store, I asked Winnie if some people came in the store just now, and she said no. And I said, well, there was a red truck that stopped in the hill with Massachusetts plates and then took off and was in your parking lot as I approached. We both shrugged it off as someone looking for someone else. That's really creepy behavior. Yeah. Enough yeah. for, you know, and enough of suspicious behavior for her to note all those details. Her radar went off. Her radar went off, but again, she did go on to, to make it clear that she never at any time felt threatened by the person. So, In retrospect, you look at it and it's like so creepy in my head because, you know, I'm just like piecing things together. But, you know, if I'm walking along and I see a truck, yeah, I don't really think twice about it. If it's looking for somebody, you know, like... It just wouldn't, you know, it's it's probably not as big of a deal in her head. But, yeah, looking back on it, you know, especially the line where she says that I could tell that somebody was watching me. And she noted what state the license plate was from. She noted there was an eagle on the back windshield. So in that clip, uh, Clint mentions that the truck actually went back towards Mora's accident scene, which, again, is, uh, geez, I don't know, a bit startling. And he says that the witness's recollection is that she spent 30 to 45 minutes inside the store. So on the low end of that, if she spent 30 minutes in there, she would have arrived at the store just before 7 p.m. If she were to see, as she was ending her visit at the store the police go by responding to the accident, right? Did I hear that correctly? That she was in the store prior to seeing the police and that was towards the end of her visit. Yeah, I think that's correct. And she walked to the store from her house. That's correct, yep. And she also noted that she had never seen that red truck before or since in the area. Now, if her walk to the store was, say, five minutes and she arrived around 6.45 to 7 o'clock, which I think that would be the time frame that she would have had to have arrived if she were to have seen the police go by responding to the accident at around 7.30. She left her house at, say, 6.30, 6.35. If it took her between 5 to 10 minutes, it couldn't have been any longer than 5 to 10 minutes to walk to, to the store, or she probably would have driven in February. So I'm, I'm going with 5 to 10 minutes between 6.30 and 6.35. So I'm not really coming to any particular conclusion here. I'm just setting the time frame uh, in my head. So when she's in the store, Mora's car must have passed by. Yeah, it does sound that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty interesting. Um, Her her account really kind of runs right up against... um, when Morris car went by. So yeah, I think, I think this could be very important. I, I guess we just don't know how or why yet. And to our knowledge, I suppose this, the actual red truck hasn't been identified. We we don't know. It's interesting. I, I can't, I, I keep saying that it's interesting because I'm playing out the time frame in my head and that red truck was enough to generate interest in, in her noting it without knowing that an accident had taken place, without knowing that something was going on about a mile down the road. So there was something about it that made her note it that in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I have to, I, I'm not going to say they're co- completely related, but, you know, um, Maura Murray went missing down the, less than a mile away, um, right around that same time frame, she's been gone over 17 years, and there was a truck that was acting suspiciously before she went missing. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think this is very, very, uh, possi- uh, very possible this is connected. 
because it, it really is something to to break down a, a little bit more in detail because mm-hmm. or a lot more in detail we don't know what time the female cashier according to the parker report claims that the truck was passing by several times she claimed that the truck had made several passes before leaving the area and around that time was when she saw somebody standing on the corner. Now, we know that that person standing on the corner, based on what Clint just said, is not that witness because, like you said, that cashier knows that witness. And she spent 30 to 45 minutes inside the store. Yeah, and probably no reason to think it's more Murray either. Right. That witness remembers Massachusetts plates, the red truck, the wooden slats, as she's approaching the store, she sees it there. She goes in and talks to the cashier, spends 30 to 45 minutes in there, leaves. And I think my assumption is that's when the female cashier sees somebody at the corner and the red truck is passing by slowly. Here's what my thinking is on this, though. If this witness who saw the red truck was aware enough to recall those details and also bring it up to the cashier, but then recall them three days later when when she's going over the series of events, I think she would have said, I was in the store talking to my friend, and we both saw a woman standing on the corner and this red truck was passing by. She never says that, which makes me think that she wasn't in the store when that happened. Separately, both of the reports, the one that Clint talked about and what's in the Parker report are mysterious and kind of suspicious so that's why it is something to dig into um i just don't know exactly what to do with it yet i think we should do it in in another episode maybe we talk to clint or talk to someone else but it, it is funny that this conversation is the collision report and this is you know what i mean like the, this is the most interesting part of the collision report and it isn't about the collision no <laughs> it draws up a lot of other um avenues to pursue directly in relation to Mora's disappearance. Okay, let's let's just read the conclusion here from Parka. He says, my opinions set forth in this report are stated to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty and probability within the field of collision reconstruction. Note, our involvement with this case was to examine the vehicle and report our findings. We were not instructed to collect any type of evidence and or make any scientific analysis other than what the SDM unit displayed, nor are we capable of offering and scientific analysis or testing this analysis reserves the right to supplement his opinions subject to further analysis and or discovery and reserves the right to respond to any and all opinions by other experts this report is based on the limited data from officials received prior to this document's date on receipt of any new document a supplemental report may be generated the aforementioned conclusions are the opinions of this office and the findings, inferences, and conclusions of my review, kinematics analysis, and or study of the collision. The Saturn was originally traveling east on Wild Amanusik Road and either passed or stopped in at the Swiftwater Way Station to fuel. Thereafter, the Saturn traveled about nine-tenths of a mile to the left, bend in the roadway near the weathered barn. From this point, the Saturn more likely than not went off the roadway along the eastbound shoulder and entered the ravine before moving further off the shoulder and striking a fixed object at an acute angle off of a vertical axis. The SDM download confirms that two events occurred with a non-deployment occurring first before the command for a deployment. Let's talk about the airbags there. Both events occurred within two one-hundredths of a second and within about one foot. The topography of the roadway at the location also coincides. And Lance, I do want to mention, you said uh, two one hundredths because it says it in the report. I'm not sure. We, we did hear that there was some additional sort of research done by some community members. Jillian mes- mentioned this to me. I think it was Ryan Coyalta who's been on the show before. But um, he said that they only go up to two tenths and not one hundredths of a second. So I'm not really sure if that's accurate or exactly what's accurate on that, but it doesn't really seem to change the effect too much. Um, Maybe a little bit, slightly, but it still seems that the events happened in very close proximity. 
And Parker goes on, he says, it is still unknown as to how the actual dent on the hood occurred. The damage itself does not match that of a tree's outer radial facade pattern. No photographs were produced by police personnel which would depict and or confirm the Saturn struck the tree line. There are also no photographs which accurately depict the Saturn's point of rest. It is unknown as to whether Maura Murray or someone else was operating the Saturn at the time of the frontal impact. It is unknown as to how many persons were even in the vehicle. We do know that the Saturn's electrical system has to have been activated with the Saturn moving forward under its own propulsion to produce two recorded events on the download from the SDM, the black box. The Saturn cannot be at rest and struck by another vehicle or a heavy object. Again, this does not mean that Maura Murray was even operating the vehicle at the time the SDM recorded a non-deployment and a deployment event. It is also not likely that an injury would have occurred to any or all occupants, and if an injury did occur, it would not have been incapacitating. Interesting finding. Yeah. And he goes on, as aforementioned, this analyst knows that there are often attempts to alter, destroy, remove, clean, or cover up evidence of a crime, but that traces as well as gross physical evidence may be left in many forms, many of these items being minute and or microscopic in nature, thus requiring the use of additional specialized examination. It is unknown as to what the speed of the Saturn was at the time of the collision due to the loss of communication between the SDM unit and the vehicle during the second impact. Based on the damage to what the Saturn underwent, it is the opinion of this analyst that the speed was extremely low with little or no possibility of injury. However, the two recorded events did occur within two one-hundredths or two-tenths, depending on the research that is done here. Either way, very quickly in between the two events of a second. The second and the larger of the events occurred after the Saturn had moved just a few feet from the first impact and commanded an airbag deployment. As a result, the Saturn has to have been moving at the time of the event, as suggested by the SDM data, Again, that's a little redundant, but I think what he's saying here is while the speed of the Saturn could not be determined, you still have a general sense of how fast the impact happened. The two events happened. Right. And uh, and there's still two events, right, which I, I think is still kind of interesting. Um, I know they happened right back to back within uh, two, two maybe tenths of a second, but what, what are those two? You know, there's a two impacts. That, that's a snowbank and the tree or and the ditch, I guess. Yeah. You know, I guess it's not specified, but it's probably two out of three things. The, the, the earth, I guess, or the ditch or a tree and the snowbank. It's got to be two out of those three. Am, am I reading something wrong here? No, no, no. The, I think the first is probably the snowbank because that's just what you would assume. If you're heading off the road in February, there's a snowbank there that's going to just naturally be the first thing that's hit. If she's not traveling at a, at a fast speed, then it's not going to deploy, but the event is recorded. Uh mm -hmm. And then almost immediately after, it's probably the ditch, right? Because there's a ditch before the tree. Right. Okay. So in that neighborhood. Okay. And he goes on. He says, the Saturn was also being operated with high beams activated, and the operator was not wearing a seatbelt. During the impacts, some sort of reddish liquid was sprayed up onto the roof and forward of the operator's position. The liquid also went down the inner panel of the driver's door. The main area of aspersion on the roof was located in the area of the stellar break to the windshield. The stellar break was the result of an interior force projecting outward. There is no evidence of any biological fluid or hair fiber root embedded in the break. And then he actually asks a question here at the end of the paragraph. He says, could the operator's upper hand struck the windshield with some sort of liquid container causing the break? Well, there you go. That seems to make some sense there. I, it's possible. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. She didn't have a seatbelt on, so I, I'm still going to lean towards her head, right? Even though it was very slow. I mean, she was probably traveling 20 miles an hour, but or, or maybe a, a little bit more. But And there's really only one, one more paragraph here. Yeah, he concludes here with two areas of the blackish-brownish smear were also located on the driver's side, the A pillar post adjacent to the stellar brake 
and the second smear or print was located on the armrest of the driver's door. Without additional specialized examination by qualified technicians, its source or any other foreign matter found within or upon the Saturn will be unknown. And that is how he concludes it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, still still some questions. I do feel better about the damage, uh, being able to say that I think the damage happened at that scene, regardless of what it hit. I don't know that that's even important. Um, but it does sound like that the damage happened at the scene, or at least the airbags deployed there, so maybe not all of the damage, which is a possibility. Right, and, and I'm starting to not be so concerned with the damage on the hood and where that was generated from, because does that matter? Was this something that she had hit that had anything to do with her disappearance? I'm thinking, based on this, probably not. Probably not, yeah. Un- unclear. Um, definitely want to dig into the red truck again uh, a little bit. But uh, Lance, you want to go over these YouTube comments? Sure. And actually on the last one, we had spoken about the gas tank and the amount of fuel that was in it. And I had made a comment towards the end, I think, about it evaporating over the course of several years sitting in, um, you know, in when it was impounded at the police barracks. And we had a few comments and some people who had uh, mechanics for um, their significant others and people who are truck drivers, and it didn't even occur to me that if the gas tank being an airtight container typically does not experience any sort of evaporation because it's an airtight container and gas is stored essentially in giant gas tanks. So if, if, if you have an airtight container and you have fuel in there, it's not going to evaporate. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I mean, if, if the gas tank was open, yeah, it would evaporate, but typically gas tanks are, are airtight. So then, geez, so then if Morimori's car was actually had a full tank, that really limits the amount of gas stations that she could have stopped at. Absolutely. I mean, that, I mean that, they, that, they, they should know. The, the police should likely know then. I, w- I would, you know, they obviously, it's unlikely they have video footage at this point because we probably would have seen that. That would have been the last video or still image of Maura Murray after the ATM uh, images. So I, I would have bet that had been put out there, right? Maybe yeah. there just wasn't any video at that gas station, or maybe they haven't located it, which is, which would be um, surprising, I guess. It'd be really surprising because if you're looking at the gas tank and it has a certain amount of gas in it, especially if it's almost full or if it is full, I mean, you're you you only have one direction that that you're looking in, which is west, and you only have a certain amount of area to cover probably up to 10 miles before that gas tank is no longer registering full. So how many gas stations are you looking at at that point? Yeah, I don't know. Ballpark, probably like five. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right, that 112, you can be on for probably in that direction, I don't know how many miles, but the first gas station before the Swiftwater Way Station is probably the one that you would have stopped at whatever that gas station is, because beyond that, you'd, you'd see a, a, a more significant loss of fuel. Right. I think there's two gas stations off of the 91 North exit, which is the way we think Mora was probably traveling, uh, and that would be Woodsville, New Hampshire. So that would probably be the most likely place uh, that if Mora got gas off of the 91 exit, that it was one of those gas stations in Woodsville. I agree with that, yeah. And on to the YouTube comments. Dwayne Porter says, Barbara Atwood said the car hit a metal pole. Kind of one that you don't see on the side of the road in the picture with Butch standing in front of his bus. Oh, yeah, I do remember that photo. And a cop by his car. Uh, maybe a mile marker. Okay, that, that could make some sense. I think, I, I, no, I, I, don't, I haven't seen any evidence of that. I suppose, um, I don't know how Dwayne Porter knows Barbara, Barbara Atwood said that. I know she did an interview um, only a couple of years ago. So maybe it was in that. But, but that could make some sense. Yeah, and you know what? That could make some sense in regards to the first event that happened. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're hitting like a mile marker post and it's uh 
enough to damage your car, but I wouldn't think that that's enough to deploy the airbag. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty quickly after is when the second event happens. And Simon here says, I'd never really put much stock into Renner's tandem driver theory until now. As others have already stated, the damage on the hood seems to fit with a collision of a trailer hitch on the back of the vehicle. And I agree. We already said it in this uh, miniseries here. It it looks like that, Um, but it doesn't seem like that's... Well, it, it, it at least doesn't seem like that's what deployed the airbags. Um, whether whether or not that actually happened or not, that Mora hit some kind of trailer hitch, unclear. The person goes on, this would also explain how and why Mora disappeared from the scene so quickly. She didn't have to wait around or hitch a ride. She just had to grab some stuff from her car and jump into the other vehicle, which was likely stopped a short distance ahead. This also explains why she waved off Butch Atwood. Who needs help from some random dude, let alone the police, when your ticket to ride is waiting only a short distance up the road? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, this is this is why I love this community, because of these uh, insights like that uh, and just allowing yourself to expand your mind um, a bit. Another reason why I love this is because of a comment like what Bootleg Pass has written here which says one of the photos shows a mangled red Jeep next to the Saturn, Chrysler branded mirror. And he refers to page four of the Parker Report and the photo on the left, the middle of the page on page four shows a red Jeep, a mangled red Jeep. Yeah, there's a couple photos of it um, on page four. Uh, You can kind of see a little bit. That's a a good theory, I'd say. Yeah, it's a good call. Jeep is a Chrysler company, and he uh, concludes here saying dollars to donuts, which is one of my favorite comparisons. Uh, the mirror came from that. Good call there, Boots. Um, yeah, Boots, give us an email. We'd love to uh, connect with you. 